Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Thanks again, as always, for joining us here on The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Nick McDonald. His latest book, The Council of Animals, will be released on July 20th by Henry Holton Company. Nick's first book was 12, written when he was 17 back in 2002, followed by The Third Brother and An Expensive Education. Much of his later work has dealt with Iraq, where he is now, Afghanistan and war, including the end of major combat operations, dealing with our second of I don't know how many campaigns we've had in that country that still reels from what we've accomplished there. The Bodies in Person is an examination into the deaths that most Americans don't know about in war. The civilians, mothers, fathers, children, grandchildren. And then the Civilization of Perpetual Movement is an examination of, a really good examination of nomadism and its history. And now the Council of Animals, which is about as much of a departure from Nick's earlier writings as I can imagine. And having been selling books for the last couple of decades, I can tell you that other than the cover, the one thing that decides a customer who's picked up a book, whether to put it down or not, is the first sentence. In 12, it was white Mike is thin and pale like smoke. In this book, it is the animals decided to vote. There was pretty much a zero chance that I wouldn't buy that book. So the main characters, uh, the cast that we meet at the outset are the door, like, sorry, the dog, the horse, the bear, the cat, the zealous crow, and damn baboons. Along the way, we encounter other creatures, some in cameo, others playing important roles in a battle for the future, such as it is of the human race, like uh, mice, cockroaches, scorpions, dangerous moles, squirrels, <laughs> slugs, bats of a sort, a perspicacious butterfly, and a goda. And to help us along our way, there are many beautiful illustrations which take their cue from an equally lovely cover. Um, which he has, Nick hasn't seen yet, um, which is the other and more important reason people buy books because everyone who comes to my bookstore does in fact judge a book by its cover. And our unidentified narrator who is full of digressions, reminds me of me, and an unusually comprehensive knowledge of all events that unfold. But is he or she a reliable narrator? And actually do we ever really meet a reliable narrator in our life? Finally, this is a book about how the human race fucks up over and over, and at the same time, kind of how comical it is that we do. So hi, Nick, and thanks for being here today. Hi, Sam. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to join you. So what's your deal with baboons anyway? <laughs> uh, well, I love baboons, uh, is my deal with them. I, uh... <laughs> yeah, they get a bad rap in this book, but, but I love looking at them. Yeah, well, it bothers me because, you know, they got those red cushions on their bottom. Why can't they just, you know, haunch over like other animals? It's like when you take one of those cushions to a football game. You know, what's the deal with evolution anyway? Yeah, that is a fair question. Uh, the baboons uh, don't have the answers, certainly not in this book. All right, well, let's leave them alone for a minute. And why don't you just go ahead because otherwise I'll do it and I screw it up. A little bit about what's happened to mankind as the book starts off and what these animals are deciding to do about it. Sure, the, the, what's happened to mankind is the calamity and it's left unexplained in the book. But as I imagine it, it's the culmination of all the bad stuff that, that, might, that we can imagine happening. Uh, and I think, you have a pretty fertile imagination. There's a wide range of bad stuff that could lead to the calamity. Uh, and some of the after effects include glowing moss, uh, super yachts grounded on the top of a cliff. There are a couple of other problems that the calamity is left behind. Most notably that most of humanity is now. Yeah. All right, well, let's hit some of the characters. Dog, I guess the dog's there first and you know, He's got this military aspect of him, especially because he's a bulldog and has kind of that Churchill look, although he's kind of on his last legs, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is, 
a good heart, that dog, but sometimes not totally clear about what he's going to be doing. Uh, and I, I actually today or yesterday was watching a bunch of bomb sniffing dogs at a checkpoint here in Kabul. And I was thinking, these dogs, they have a real hard job, kind of a bad deal for these dogs. Uh, and this guy, he, he takes his job very seriously, even though with the humans all gone, it's kind of better for him. He doesn't have such a hard job anymore. Yeah, and he remembers uh, his loyalty and the way the military treated him, and he's very ops kind of guy. Um, but I, I like the way, because it's exactly like me, and maybe you to a certain extent, how if someone throws a stick, <laughs> I have to go get it. You know, no matter how many times they throw it, I have no choice. I just have to go get it. You know what I mean? Yeah, certainly the dog, the you and the dog identify about that. And then there's the problem of new tricks, old dogs, old dogs, new tricks. The, the fetching problem is a serious one for him. Yeah, I know. It's like, um, speaking of old dogs, you do a bunch of stuff in there that must have been fun, like uh, Wolf Point and On Porpoise and the Mock Stretchy and <laughs> Bear With Me for a Moment and her views. You must have had a lot of fun doing that. Probably too much fun. Yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> kind of doesn't seem like you. It's like you switched gears in life or something, you know? <laughs> well, uh, I've always been a sucker for goofy puns. <laughs> well, okay. All right, let's, I, you know, maybe you don't want to do it, but I do. So like the horse, you know, basically he's there. He wants sugar cubes. He's got dandelions and carrots, but why bananas? I mean, do horses like bananas? Well, the horse in this case has been fooled into asking for bananas by the baboon. And this is not the smartest horse at the no. race. Uh, uh, also good heart, but kind of confused. Although actually come to think of it, I don't imagine a horse would say no to a banana. I've never seen a horse eat a banana, but no, I don't know. Just like goats. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah he's, but a goat, goat, goats will eat anything, right? Yeah. I have three I'm looking at right now. Um, oh. <laughs> right. On. Are there other animals in your house, in your home? Well, I'm looking out the window at the goats. There's one alpaca. There's a bunch of chickens and a re ridiculously asshole rooster that attacks me. I one time killed a rooster by mistake because he was coming at me with his claws out and we kind of did like, like the moles, it was kind of a ninja kind of thing. And I mm -hmm. kicked him in the chest, not expecting him to expire because of it, but I do have remorse for that. Um, yeah. See, this is what I that, do. I yeah, that, I I, that's, a, that's a sad story for that rooster, but they're, they're vicious. He was, it was a big <laughs> ass rooster too. But okay, so, the okay, bear. so there's the dog, the horse, the bear. The bear uh, is, is, is bear. really cool. Well, I like the bear because, you know, he has two Shakespearean scenes. He has a last poor York and he has his Ham, Hamlet-like, sorry, he has his Julius Caesar-like soliloquy yeah. at the beginning. I, the, the baboon is a clever animal, you know. Brutus is an honorable man. That was pretty good. Oh, th thank you. I'm so glad you picked up on that stuff. I had a great time writing it. And uh, I guess it's pretty clearly Shakespeare knockoffs. But the bear, the bear is an actor bear. And the bear was a Hollywood bear. And the bear was inspired by a, a real bear whose name I can't remember. But there was a famous Hollywood bear who in the 90s, I think, yeah. was sort of the bear in all the movies. Uh, like in that movie with on the river trip with Anthony Hopkins and, and Alec Baldwin. I forget the bear's yeah. name, uh, Gus, yeah. maybe. Anyway, so this bear, like that bear, is a sort of a high-flying bear and, and so gets to know humanity in its Hollywood incarnation and has some melodramatic existential angst about his own bear future. Yeah, like uh, how nice it would be to live in the antediluvian, uh, what is that stuff called? <laughs> the antediluvian. Ooze. <laughs> yeah, which sounds like it wouldn't be that bad, actually, at least as far as my life's concerned. Um, and then there's the cat, and he's like every other cat. You don't know what to expect. He doesn't really care about you, like especially with the mouse. 
I mean, the mouse was just there at the meeting. I mean, you know, he, but then he has so many other aspects to him, you know, honorable aspects. Yeah, the cat is very complicated character. Uh, wouldn't trust him for a second. On the other hand, kind of the best ally for humanity when it comes right down to it. Yeah, the baboon has an intelligent deal with the cat, which is kind of like, I don't want to give away things, but I always do. But then the horse has the deal, which is just a dumb horse. And, um, and then the crow, who's like, kind of like lots of people in America right now, this overzealous, religious, the great egg, bird blessings to all kind of guy. But yeah, the crow is, is very uh, superstitious, to say the least. And I actually, I'm, I am not, I have some superstitions myself. I was hiking once through Scotland and I saw a broken down house with a bunch of crows in it. And I, there was something about those crows. I did feel like they were kind of talking uh, to each other, to me, it wasn't clear, but I got a really weird vibe off of these crows and stayed with me ever since. So maybe this is where they started their Buddhist religion. They're well, super you smart crows. You know, they can, they can solve puzzles. They can use tools. Yeah, he's kind of proud. Well, he's, well, that goes to the baboons. The baboons remind me a little bit like of Trump, except they're incredibly much smarter than he is. But I don't think they're smarter than Dick Cheney. Right. Well, I don't know about that. I do know I've been reading a little bit about baboons and I learned, I think I've got this right, but I read this wonderful thing about Robert Sapolsky, who wrote a book called A Primate's Memoir. He's a neuroscientist who was a primatologist to begin with. And he writes about how baboons, uh, when one, of, usually in a troop, one picks on two, two picks on three, three picks on four, and so on down the line, and, and usually not out of order. But if number one is kicked out of the top spot, and gets knocked down, then everybody starts picking on number one. So when one gets down to seven, four, five, and six all pick on them. And so do eight, nine, and trying to beat up on them. So often ones, when they get booted from the top, will go to a whole other troop and kind of live out their lives in quiet anonymity. Yeah, it's, uh, I was reading about them too. There's like, there's like four, four different species of baboon, you know, like, uh, I forget what they are, like the yellow and, Guinea and other ones, but they all share. They're weird animals with, you know, the, the red pads and then also the red and blue faces. It's, and then when you have him reach his hand up like that, it always reminds me of the um, beginning scene of 2001 where he does that and then he releases the bone and then it turns into the spaceship. You remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's like that yeah. kind of. And then it's like insects and rodents are kind of given short shrift in the book, like mammals kind of do, right? It's like, and they're yeah. pissed off. But I really think insects are the future, not just because we're gonna eat them for protein, but because it's collective action. There are a lot of them. And if they get together, I think they're really gonna be able to do things like they do in this. Yeah, lifting a bear up, for example. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah, like the cockroaches are saying, look, we've been here for 500 million years. We can be here for 500 more. I mean, Evolution just decided at the beginning, hey, this is cool. We really don't have to fuck with this. It works. Yeah, not, nothing to improve on. Yeah. Um, you know, they could survive a nuclear war, I understand. And then they're, oh, yeah, you're talking about understanding the crows a little bit. Talk about GRAC, which is kind of the lang lingua franca, franca of the Animalia world in the book. That's exactly right. GRAC is the language the lingua franca of the animal kingdom. So baboons speak baboon, lizards speak lizards, elephants speak elephant, but every animal speaks grack. With the exception of one animal, humans, who never learned how to speak grack. And why humans never learned to speak grack is a subject of some debate among the rest of the animals uh, and a big problem for humans. They just haven't realized that yet. And this is one of the problems that they have to deal with post calamity. I, I myself am trying to learn to speak Grack. You seem to have a pretty good grasp of it with your goats out front, but I, it's an ongoing struggle. Yeah, my closest relationship is with Beatrice. She's, she and I have a... <laughs> 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 kind of 
You know, Hi. I actually, I spoke with a, I spoke with this wonderful ecologist the other day, a guy named Carl Safina, who wrote, who's written a bunch of great books, one called Becoming Wild. And he studies culture and animals. He studies the culture of, of macaws and whales and, uh, and, and chimpanzees actually in this particular book. Uh, and yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm in awe of the way these animals communicate. Yeah. yeah I, there was some point to that. I'm afraid it slipped my mind as I was trying to remember it. I like um, just skipping around. I like the way the, the the baboon keeps spinning up this phlegm, and the dog, you know, is like saying, you know, maybe you need to be a vet. And uh, yeah, and it's like, and then he's also saying the dog's also saying how <laughs> they led humanity to the moon. And then I thought of that Russian dog Leica. I guess that's who you're referring to, right? You know, I hadn't thought of that, but. I guess, yes, I, Leica is the dog. Uh, and you're right, that, that is where it came from. But I actually don't know the story of Leica in particular. Oh yeah, well she died on the way back in and they had a little picture of her with her little helmet. And I felt really, so well, like with the rooster, I felt really sorry for her, but she was, she, sac she sacrificed herself for her humanity. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and that song. Um, that who sings the song it's uh, old lang syne and um take me out to the ball game i forgot the, the cock the cockroaches sing it together it's a great song but i i was singing it by myself i wouldn't do that with other people around but i could only do take me out to the ball game i couldn't fit old lang syne so the whole song i sang to take me out to the ball game well the cockroaches there there are several hundred thousand of them singing it at a time so they're able to do harmonies in a way that you and i can't yeah i can see that yeah it's like the beach boys uh yeah it's kind of the brian wilson of the animal kingdom the spokes cockroach spokes roach yeah it's a shame about brian wilson i mean at the very beginning if you watch some of the first ones where he's actually harmonizing it was so much it was so cool and then you know then he went kind of crazy but mm. oh, this is what I do, but I digress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the dangerous moles. Yeah, the dangerous moles, they are, they are uh, ninja moles. They are experts in camouflage. They're quite good tumblers. They are armed with, with blow darts uh, and smoke, exploding smoke bombs. And they live by a code, which is loosely inspired by the code of the Ronin, the rogue samurai. Uh, and at, at fairly early in the book, about halfway, they pledge allegiance to the cat on, a, on the cat's top secret mission. One of my... Uh favorite lines in the book there's lots of them but one of my favorite is uh well two of them where the lizard which i won't spoil that either but when uh the cat says let him let him channel his let him, and then <laughs> above splaining it's like <laughs> it's like cancel culture kind of gets into the book at times reminds me of hilaria baldwin's uh claim to uh latino ancestry <laughs> mm. Well, I, I am not familiar with that, but I do know that the animals above ground and below ground, they get quite upset when the reverse try to explain to them how things are going one way or the other. And this is part of why the moles are such a, a attractive characters to me sometimes in this book, because they have taken a vow of silence, which makes them doubly dangerous sometimes. Yeah. And uh, moles are blind, right? Are they blind? I, I think they have... I, I think the expression is blind as a mole, uh, but I don't know if they're totally blind or whether they just are sort of functionally blind. I don't think vision is the way that they get through the earth. And again, without spoiling, you know, they have this timer that's kind of almost mystical in a way. <laughs> okay, actually that, that's my favorite line in the book when it's up and then <laughs> comes out and he goes, hello babies. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that that butterfly. I just, I just, I knew that butterfly had a lot of attitude. 
also it's it's coming out of its cocoon it's ready to make an entrance yeah he was uh and then you know what's the deal okay so the narrator is like a narrator and it starts you know it's like some kind of like gulliver's travel kind of thing or um when there's somebody else telling a story and you're not quite sure <clears throat> at times whether you can trust him hmm. but i don't i don't know if you uh actually meant that that we we weren't sure whether we could trust him or not well uh, i think that every narrator is can is not a, every narrator narrator you have to decide whether you trust him or not this one is particularly tricky yeah oh and it's also fun how uh the dog has this romantic or the beginning of a romantic feeling towards another one of the characters and uh mm. i thought that was nice well we'll see how it works out for the dog but he's his heart is certainly a flutter yeah and like he says you know be careful my lovely or something like that mm -hmm. i'll in the in the climactic final scene before we go back to the narrator's recapitulation um and again without spoiling anything i thought man the jig was up but the bear once again and uh and the cat kind of just barely snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat not to do another one of your things but it is the jaws of the feet. My great editor, uh, Sarah Crichton, sort of when we were working on the one of the drafts of the book, she she encouraged me to to cast a lighter eye on the end of it. Uh, and so I have her to thank for having it not not be quite as grim as it might have been otherwise. Yeah, not that you're going to do it, but there could almost be a sequel. And also, and also, the fate of the humans seems appropriate um, in a lot of ways because it's the obverse of what happens regularly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know about a sequel, but I do think that there's a lot of room for these animals to have further adventures. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but how come you? How come you? I have an idea for for the foxes maybe to go to. I, I have been thinking about a particular fox that wants to go on a trip to the Bermuda Triangle to solve some mysteries down there. Yeah, the fox only appears at the end. Um, and I also like the way the tortoises are kind of like the archivists because they're there for so long except for the goat up. But, you know, they're always around so they kind of know what happened and they also have that slow, deliberate style of recounting things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Although, as the narrator, you know, points out, some people think the crickets have equally good historical ideas. They just focus with much more, you know, much more detail-oriented kind of way. Yeah, you really do hit a lot of animals in this thing. You know, I didn't think so at first, but you know, you you kind of included a whole bunch of them. They just kind of pop in. Yeah, I I I think that the there weren't that many that I wanted to get in there that I didn't. Uh, but the more animals, the better, is the way I looked at it. Yeah, I agree. So anyway, since we got this three second delay and we go in and out, um, and I'll let you go too, is that I really liked it a lot. I'm amazed that you went off on this. It just doesn't seem like you, but I'm so glad that you did. And like I said, it will be on the front shelf and, uh, my daughter's really good. She can hide, kind of hand sell. She'll come out from behind the counter, grab the book and say, okay, you have to buy this book. So that'll help you too. I, thank you. That I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really different book for me, but it was really the most fun I've ever had writing a book. And I just yeah. would write, I would write about talking animals all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to keep doing it. Cool. Yeah, for a while, I think. All right. Well, so we got this three second lag and all that. So um, let's end it there. And thank you so much for taking time out. And thank you so much for what, what you've done 
in another sense with regard to explaining America from the side of the world that you're on right now. I think it was really good. I mean, thank you for having me. I'm really sorry the connection is so bad. Usually it's better than this. Uh, I we've, we've kind of caught some bad luck tonight, I think. Uh, well, yeah. for, the most, for the most part, there's just a couple of spots and I mark the times where we can edit things out and we should be good. So in any event, uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Okay, yeah, thanks again for the kind words about the book. And, and I was listening to your podcast, and I'm a fan. It's really cool. Uh, oh, thanks. Thank you. I'll see you. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Hey, so I'm staying on because I just wanted to say, he's such a cool guy, and it's such a cool book. And, um, you know, I go back and find that book 12 and read it because you're not going to believe that he wrote it when he's 17 years old. I mean, I don't know what I was doing with 17, but it's a great book. And then later he goes into a much more clinical examination of the world and nomads. It's like the best book on nomads ever written. And um, yeah, he's just a great guy. And if you also really want to get into it, read his backstory, read about his family and what people stupid people were trying to say about him at the very beginning when he wrote 12 because he was so young but he had these uh, incredible connections as well so he's always asked uh about nepotism and stuff but i wasn't going to go there because he's lived with it for 20 years but anyway um and he has a lot of balls because he goes to a lot of dangerous places and he's in one of them right now in Mosul, and um he has an organization where he raises money to rebuild Mosul after we destroyed it. And um, I really don't know his true feelings about what we did, but you need to read the books. So anyway, this was another great one. Sorry about the audio and the video cutout. Um, as you're listening to this, you'll realize that we've edited out most of those problems. So thanks as always, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. So long.